Hello everyone, welcome to my channel dedicated to the wonderful, whimsical world of language. Today's topic has to do with what was perhaps one of the most unlikely of friendships to form between people from exceptionally different backgrounds, and yet both groups share more in common than might be evidenced at first glance. Introducing the Basque Algonquian Pigeon, and I feel like just the name itself requires a bit of explaining before we really start getting into it. We've talked about pigeons a few times before in this channel, and the simplest of definitions is that a pigeon is a grammatically simplified language that develops between groups of people that don't have a language in common. The Basques are native to the Basque country, the territory of which is shared by France and Spain, situated on the western end of the Pyrenees mountain range and the Bay of Biscay. Today, there are approximately 3 million people in the world as a whole who claim Basque ancestry, and out of those, about 750,000-ish claim to speak the language, also known as Euskara. Now, the reason that the Basques are a very special people is, to put it plain and simple, their origin is shrouded in mystery. In a nutshell, it's theorized that the modern Basques are the only surviving descendants of pre-Indo-European peoples, such as the ancient Vascons and Aquitanians. The Basque language is a language isolate, completely unrelated to any other living language. It's agglutinating and has an irrigative absolute of alignment, which is completely different from literally every other European language. I definitely want to do a full video on them one day in the future, but for the purposes of this video, just know that the Basques and their language is super ancient, is super mysterious, and the fact that they played a role in North American exploration leading to the development of a pidgin mixed with Native American languages is just absolutely mind-blowing. In any case, moving on to the Algonquian part of the pidgin. The Algic language family is one of the largest language families in North America, and the vast majority of Algic languages belong to the Algonquian subfamily, stretching all the way from the Rocky Mountains to Atlantic Canada. Back in the grand old days of exploration of the 1500s, when the Basques reached the eastern shores of North America, they came across various Algonquian peoples, such as the Mi'kmaq and the Montagnier, also known as the Innu. In the present day, the Mi'kmaq language has somewhere between 7 to 9,000 speakers, out of a population of roughly 160,000 who claim some form of Mi'kmaq ancestry. The Innu language is spoken by around 10,000 speakers, out of a population of roughly 27,000 who claim some form of Innu ancestry. The Basques also came across the Inuit, whose language is a part of the Eskimo Aleut language family, spoken way further up north in the Arctic regions but apparently the Basques considered them to be hostile, so they mostly strayed away from them. And there were other native groups that the Basques likely came across, such as the Delaware, the Abenaki, the Maliset, the Beotuk, the St. Lawrence Iroquoians, and the list just goes on. The Algonquian peoples of Mi'kmaq and Inu, however, arguably had the best and most extensive relations with the Basques in comparison to other tribes, and so the Algonquian Basque pigeon was born. In this video, I'll be focusing mostly on these peoples. According to historian Peter Backer, Unfortunately, many older historians were not aware of the importance of the Basques in the early history of Canada. Some books on the early history of New France do not even mention the Basques, or they speak of Spaniards and French when they mean Basques. By the late Middle Ages, the Basques were renowned for their advanced shipbuilding technologies, one of the best in Europe, on top of which they were the inventors of a number of whaling and fishing techniques. Eventually, this is what brought them to the North American shores, in search of fish and whales, and thus what made them establish trading relations with the natives. There are even some scholars claiming that the Basques may have reached the shores of Nova Scotia as early as 1372, a few centuries after the Vikings, but still well over a century before Columbus, though this is debatable. The Basques played such a significant role in exploring the New World that in fact the British and French followed the roots of Basque whalers when exploring it themselves, as many of these routes were shorter and safer than those followed by the Spanish. Evidence suggests that the Basques established at least nine settlements in Newfoundland and Labrador, primarily in the general area of the Gulf of St. Lawrence, the largest of which could hold up to 900 people at a time. It is estimated that the pigeon came into existence around the 1530s, as the Basques began not only trading with the natives, but also sharing meals and playing games. A few Jesuit missionary reports and early traveler's log mentioned that the Basques had better relations with the natives than did any other European nation. One of the earliest official accounts of the existence of the pigeon comes from Esteban de Garibay, a chronicler of King Philip II of Spain, who in 1571 published a book in which he argues that the Basque language is not a difficult language to learn. Since the sailors of the province of Gipuzkoa and the lordship of Biscay and the Basque country go each year to the newly discovered land to fish and hunt, 
the savages of that region learned their Cantabrian language despite the brief communication of such short duration that they have with the people here just once a year for a period of less than three months. And if that people, deprived of reason and organization, is able to learn it, how much easier it would be for the people of respectable life of our old world? Fun fact, no. Just for so many reasons, just no. The golden age of the Algonquian Basque Pigeon is said to have occurred somewhere between 1580 to 1635, at the height of Basque activities in North America. There are a few really cool accounts from that time period written by various people that I'd like to share with you. The first one is from a French inquisitor called Pierre de Lancre in his 1613 report on Basque witchcraft. He remarks that the Canadians did not trade with the French in any other language than that of the Basques. The French writer Marc Lescarbeau in his 1618 History of New France remarks, The tribes of New France have been so long frequented by the Basques that the language of the coastal tribes is half Basque. Lescarbeau goes on to write, the Mi'kmaq have also a language of their own, known only to themselves, though for sake of convenience they speak to us in language which is more familiar to us, with which much Basque is mingled. And finally, the most amusing one in my opinion has to be from a Jesuit missionary Paul Lejeune, who worked among the Mi'kmaq and the Innu in the 1630s. He wrote a report detailing the use of a pigeon between the French and the Innu. I have noticed in the study of their language that there is a certain jargon between the French and the savages, which is neither French nor Indian, and yet when the French use it they think they are speaking the Indian tongue, and the savages in using it think they are speaking good French. I can just picture a Frenchman and an Inu speaking to each other in what neither of them realizes to be a Basque-based pigeon, being so proud of themselves for thinking that they speak the language of the other fluently, and, and that's just hilarious. Now let's take a little look at the language itself and what it looked and sounded like. The majority of the vocabulary is definitely based on Basque. For example, the word endia from Basque handia, meaning large, the word kesona from Basque gizona, meaning man, and ania from Basque anaya, meaning brother. However, some personal pronouns are taken from Mi'kmaq, such as kir, meaning you. So, for example, in the pigeon, to ask brother, are you the captain? you would say ania, kir kaptain, or as in proper Basque, you would say anaya, kapitaina tozara. Fascinatingly enough, as a result, the proper Mi'kmaq language went on to integrate a number of Basque loanwords that are still used to this day. For example, the word for shirt in Basque is atorra, which became atorai in the pidgin, which in turn became atle in proper Mi'kmaq. But the craziest grammatical development, in my opinion, some sources say it could also just be a pure astronomical coincidence, but the Basque formula for creating plural nouns, ak, is the same as in many Algonquian languages, ak. As mentioned above, the Basque word for brother is anaya, so the plural form, brothers, becomes anayak. Mikmaku is the singular form of the native nation. And if you want to make it plural, it becomes Mi'kmaq. It might not seem like much, but I think this is absolutely mind-blowing. If it is just a pure coincidence, then what the hell are the chances of something like this happening? And if it isn't a coincidence, then the fact that such essential and important grammatical feature as friggin' plurals came into being in a Native American language after decades of contact with European visitors, the Basques nonetheless, then what the hell did they use before? I haven't read much about the history of Mi'kmaq itself, nor do I know anything about modern Mi'kmaq grammar, so if anybody knows more about this, please leave your knowledge in the comments below. Apart from that, there are still many places in Canada, the names of which may be traced back to Basque etymologies. On top of that, turns out that the last name Basque is quite common among the Mi'kmaq, especially in parts of New Brunswick. A good example of this is Dr. Elsie Charles Basque a revered author and teacher of the Mi'kmaq language who fought for the survival of her native culture and traditions. She passed away in 2016, less than a month before her 100th birthday. Nevertheless, I'm sure that her life's work and memory will live on for generations to come. Okay, now, language is great and all, and as discussed above, it was the Basques who came to the North American shore, but while doing research, I came across a few fascinating instances of the Mi'kmaq going to the Basque country instead. In a paper by Peter Bakker, he writes, 
According to several European sources, Basques, but also Bretons and possibly Portuguese, sometimes took natives to their home country. The Mi'kmaq chief Mesamowit was the house guest of the mayor of the French Basque city, Bayona, before 1580. Another Mi'kmaq chief claimed to have been baptized in Bayona before 1611. According to a British source, debatable, two ships with a number of Mi'kmaqs arrived in Ziburu in Iparalde in 1597. Even as late as 1620, Basques took an Inuit family to their homeland for a period of time, where they apparently learned some Euskara. All these stories are just so fascinating and so cool. Can you imagine being an Algonquian native being brought over in a ship, which took several weeks or even months of nothing but never-ending ocean, to an early Renaissance European city? It would basically be like arriving on a different planet, pretty much. But even cooler still, more recently, there have been attempts to establish relations between the Mi'kmaq and the Basques in our time. In 1996, a group of Mi'kmaq people from Gespegawagi sent a letter to the Basque government requesting the establishment of formal relations. Unfortunately, it, it doesn't seem like it really went anywhere. But then, in 2006, according to a newsletter by Aitor Esteban, a professor at the University of Deusto, the Apaizak Obeto expedition was launched the crew members of which actually visited the Mi'kmaq community and have been trying to establish relations ever since. And this is where our tale comes to an end. I had a lot of fun researching this topic. Ever since I happened upon the Wikipedia article, I was so intrigued, I just had to learn more and share it with the world. Interestingly, there's also a Basque Icelandic pigeon of similar origin, because the Basques used to fish in whale in Iceland as well. But in my personal opinion, Algonquin is more obscure than Icelandic and therefore more interesting. So, more on Basque Icelandic in a future video, perhaps. It's the little obscure and unknown interactions like these that make the human story so damn interesting. And it just goes to show that at the end of the day, people are just people who just want to explore, trade, share stories, and make friends. I wish nothing but the very best to all the Basques, Mi'kmaq, Innu, and Algonquin peoples of the world. May your relations improve and may your languages and cultures survive and thrive and be passed on to future generations. I'll be leaving a bunch of resources for further reading in the video description below. Thank you so much for watching, may you have a great day and a wonderful night, peace out.